Hi, everyone. Welcome to Life Redefined Season 2, an online film discussion where we're sharing inspiring stories of young adult brain tumor survivors. Thank you for joining us today. This amazing event has been generously sponsored by SelectPath Professional Financial Services. Thank you, SelectPath, for making this happen. We appreciate the support. I'm Amanda Hutter, Support Services Specialist here at Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. With me throughout the event is the talented Dr. Mike Lang, a digital storytelling specialist. Thank you, Mike, uh, for leading us through this initiative. Today, we have a very creative Luke Wang with us today. Thank you for being here and sharing your story. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Well, yeah, man, I'm super excited uh, for today, episode three of the series. Um, and uh, because I think, you know, Luke has some really uh, important nuggets of wisdom in his story uh, that we'll get to dig into um, and uh, in, in a minute. But but just I wanted to remind everyone watching as we watch Luke's story, uh, think about one thing that resonates with you in his story. And that uh, could be a word, a phrase, an image or an idea. And please go ahead and put that in the chat below so that we can all learn from each other uh, through the things that each of us sees in Luke's story. And uh, yeah, I don't want to talk too much beforehand, Luke. I, I just want to get in the story. We'll have a good discussion afterwards. So are you ready to go? All right, here we go. Here's Luke's story, everyone. Back in high school, I was known as a pretty boy. I was proud of my long hair and baby face. Before I knew it, I became the most popular kid in school. I was young, healthy, and full of dreams. Halfway through grade 10, I began experiencing unquenchable thirst. I started drinking 15 bottles of water and making hundreds of bathroom trips every day. My teacher saw I was skipping, so I nearly dropped out from school and became imprisoned at home. I avoided hanging out with friends because finding bathrooms in public was a nightmare. My parents searched for answers everywhere, but I was brushed off, misdiagnosed, and given antidepressants. Nobody believed me. My dad requested a brain scan, but my family doctor refused to waste government funds. I couldn't take it. I cried, God, why are you letting this happen? I felt like I was climbing a mountain with no top, but with no way down. I became suicidal. The next two years will be the loneliest years of my life. During this time, my dad, a famous artist, taught me how to paint. I began painting mountains because the rugged rocks buried under the cold snow represented me, alone and forgotten. One morning, I had an excruciating headache. It felt like boulders were crushing my brains, and my vision went all blurry, like opening my eyes underwater. I remember crying and throwing up. My mom rushed me to the hospital. After eight hours of waiting for a CT scan, the results came out. I'll never forget the chilling words of the unconcerned neurosurgeon. You have a brain tumor. My heart dropped. My living hell would get even worse. After waking from a biopsy, my vision was still blurred. My optic nerves were damaged during the operation. The hospital didn't know why I was thirsty and recklessly limited me to four cups a day. I thought I would die of dehydration. It wasn't until many days later that we learned that the cause of the thirst was my damaged pituitary gland from the tumor. One day, while I was left unattended, my body suddenly began shaking uncontrollably. I collapsed on the floor and blacked out, but still conscious. The last thing I remember was hearing screaming and feeling hands grabbing me. Over the next few days, the neurosurgeon made a grave mistake. He stopped one of my medications, which caused a cold white. They tried to tranquilize me, but didn't work. They tried again, and that was when the worst thing happened. They overdosed me. I went into a coma and put on life support while given 12 days to live. Either I wake up or they pull the plug and I'll be dead. My dad said those were the hardest days of his life. My parents spent each day on their knees praying for God to save me. On the 12th day, 
A miracle happened. I was awake. My family was overjoyed. The doctors were dumbfounded. Countless friends from church visited me. They cooked for my family. And one even stayed overnight with me, reading the Bible to me because I was too scared. Though it felt like I was climbing a mountain with no top, countless people have climbed alongside me in the stormy journey. Eventually, I was allowed short trips from the hospital. One day while visiting the mall, I saw someone from school. The first thing he said to me was, You got fat! Stop eating so much! I was so angry and humiliated. I hated my appearance. I couldn't look at the mirror without wanting to smash it. My oncologist said I'll never be slim again from radiation treatment and my medication. I was heartbroken. I could never go back to being the pretty boy I used to be. I'm still struggling with my body image, but I'm learning to love myself even more. Ten years later, I'm now sharing my story at churches, schools, and even at a TED Talk. I would later climb two more mountains of cancer. Though the trek up the mountain is long and painful, look back and see how far you've climbed you'll realize how strong you've become. Awesome, there we go. Luke's story, wow, what a story. Um, man, there's so many things that stand out to me in there, but I, I have to say the one that really uh, sort of gets me is just this uh, this delayed diagnosis that you experienced, right, Luke? I mean, that's a very common part of getting a brain tumor as a young adult, but yours spend years, <laughs> right? And uh, and then, you know, there's this metaphor, this wonderful metaphor of climbing a mountain with no top. It's such an apt description of of this delayed diagnosis. And, and so my question for you uh, to kick us off here is uh, what came first? climbing a mountain with no top or all those wonderful mountain paintings, you know, I just want to get a look into your creative process here as you're creating your digital story was which, which came first, you know, did you find the photos of the mountains and think, wow, it's like a mountain with no top, this delayed diagnosis, or was it the other way around? It was actually in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And so when I first started painting mountains, it was actually in the midst of the misdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I was just talking with this about like my father. Like, I originally I had two titles: was Pretty Boy and I Lift My Eyes Up. And it's hard because they're both like relevant titles for the story. Mm -hmm. But uh, I chose Pretty Boy because that's how I felt physically, and like for the in my faith journey, I lift my eyes up. Where it really shaped how I painted, and mm -hmm. the reason is my dad. You know, he's an artist, and so in the story, I kind of said that he taught me how to paint. And so my inspiration for painting actually came from a verse called uh, from Psalms. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help mm -hmm. comes from a God who created the heavens and the earth. And my dad really just told me, hey, you know, you're going through so much pain. Why not just like do something with your pain? Mm -hmm. And how, you know, even oysters, they, pearls are made from just like factories. They're made through pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. And so through this journey, I'm, I'm, I was able to create all these paintings of mountains and some of them actually became uh they they even won awards. So yeah, that's awesome. So so really, this idea of a mountain with climbing a mountain with no top was something that actually motivated you in the middle of this delayed diagnosis experience. So it wasn't from the digital story. You just used the, all of that in your in your story. Awesome, cool. Well, hey, I I want to get Amanda in here. Amanda, you know, as you're watching Luke's story, what was one thing that stood out to you? Um. You mentioned suicide very briefly, um, but that really stuck out with me. Um, I feel a lot of people feel that way um, when they get their diagnosis, and especially since they, you, for example, had it for so long, um, but not a lot of people talk about it. It's kind of like, you know, they, they have those feelings, but maybe they just don't feel like they're in that space to bring it up. So I'm really... You know, I'm glad that you mentioned it because I think a lot of people can um, identify with that. And so I just want to put it out there for those that are watching right now. 
if this is something that you think about or um, have been thinking about, uh, please reach out to us and we'd be happy to help you get the right supports um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Such an important part. I love how you didn't gloss over that. Right. And uh, and you were very open and honest. And I totally agree with Amanda. You know, I think we need more people who are willing to tell that story uh, if we're going to be able to you know, change the conversations we have around it. So uh, it's awesome. So, so Luke, I mean, we, we also have to talk about another big theme in your story, uh, which is the, the, the body image thing, right. You know, tied to the title of pretty boy. So, you know, tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, where you're currently at with all of that, because, um, you know, we have that, you know, moment where someone says you cut fat, you know, and how devastating that was to hear, right, in your story. But uh, sort of where are you at now with this idea of body image and, and sort of have you been able to move past some of those negative comments people have given you? And if so, how? Well, great question. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, honestly, it's, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's still going on. And I wish it was just like, a, oh, that that's in the past. But Especially, you know, in, in the Asian culture, a lot of aunties and uncles, the first thing they say with good intent, like, oh, you put on weight. <laughs> and like, for me, I'm like, uh, it's, it's just such a huge trigger. And mm. honestly, I felt like this whole journey, I also mentioned it briefly in the video, but it's just a matter of loving yourself for who you are, especially mm -hmm. on the inside, not on the outside. Mm -hmm. It's been so hard because it's been 10 years since my diagnosis. Like I still feel like crap, <laughs> even though, you know, I'm changing on the outside, but I feel like it doesn't matter as long as if I don't love myself and accept myself for what I look like. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to be yeah. Yeah. It's interesting thinking about sort of the cultural elements of that too, right? Your people, you know, that's what they say when they see you, right? You know, it's not, and, and their intention is not uh, to, to trigger uh, a body image discussion, but that's what occurs for you, right? And I think, yeah, it's really great for people to know, you know, that, that the people live with this every day. It's not something that you figure out and uh, it's all, you know, butterflies and rainbows. Uh, it's an ongoing thing to deal with the implications of, of a brain tumor diagnosis. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks again, Luke, uh, for being here. Really appreciate you telling your story in such an open, honest way. And I'm sure this will be one of many, many more times you'll be sharing your story. Uh, for everyone who's watching online, uh, please write your thoughts and ideas in the chat below. Luke and Amanda and I will log in and make sure that we uh, uh, continue this conversation with you. And yeah, make sure you tune in on Thursday where we got another amazing story coming up. And uh, yeah, thanks again for being here. We'll, we'll see you guys later. Bye.